the Oscars. But one of the highest grossing films of the year didn't get any awards. The Super Mario Brothers movie, based on a video game. Come on, Mario! Our big adventure begins now! Ah, get it up, get it up, get it up! I'm Michaela Lefrac. Today on Vermont Edition, the big business of video games. Vermont Public's Bryant Denton looks into the growth of one specific genre, horror. He'll tell us about the big year horror had in Hollywood and gaming. With remakes of legendary games like Resident Evil 4 and Dead Space, and the long-awaited sequel, Alan Wake 2. Then we'll learn about what it takes to design a successful video game. And we'll talk to the head of an esports training center in Essex Junction. That's all coming up on Vermont Edition. First, this hour's news. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Lakshmi Singh. Special Counsel Robert Hur is testifying before the House Judiciary Committee this hour about his investigation into President Biden's handling of classified documents. The need to show my work was especially strong here. The Attorney General had appointed me to investigate the actions of the Attorney General's boss, the sitting President of the United States. I knew that for my decision to be credible, I could not simply announce that I recommended no criminal charges and leave it at that. I needed to explain why. Her's report concluded criminal charges were not warranted, but it raised concerns about Biden's memory and recall abilities, an assessment that spurred swift condemnation from the White House as the 81-year-old Biden faces re-election. Many voters have raised concerns about Biden's age, as well as that of the GOP's presumptive nominee, Donald Trump, who turned 78 in June. There are several primary elections and a presidential caucus today. Republicans in Hawaii will hold their presidential caucus while voters in the Northern Mariana Islands, Washington State, Mississippi, and Georgia hold primaries. One key race is in Georgia from member station WABE in Atlanta. Here's Sam Greenglass. About 415,000 Georgians have already cast ballots during early voting. The ballots were finalized a while ago, so the name of former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley and others will still appear. Roy and Jenny Luke had been hoping to vote for Haley this fall and lament that Trump is poised to become the GOP nominee. He lost to Joe Biden once. So what makes us think he's going to win this time around? I would never, ever vote for Trump. So it would have to be Biden. Unlike his wife, Roy Luke says he'll ultimately have to vote for Trump. How independent-minded voters like the Lukes vote this fall could shape the outcome. For NPR News, I'm Sam Greenglass in Atlanta. The first major shipment of food aid by sea has set off from Cyprus for Gaza, where the U.N. says children are dying of malnutrition and wider famine is imminent. The charity World Central Kitchen says 200 tons of food loaded onto a barge will arrive in Gaza this week. NPR's Jana Raff has more from Amman. World Central Kitchen has been distributing meals in Gaza since the start of the war in October. But Israel, citing security concerns, has restricted aid going into Gaza by truck, the most efficient way to send it in. A Spanish aid organization, Open Arms, provided the vessel. The organization's spokesperson, Laura Lanuza, said they spent three weeks getting it ready, including Israeli scans of each box of food before it set off. Finally, we have been able to do it. As this is the beginning of this new humanitarian maritime corridor from Cyprus. She said assuming all goes well, there's more food waiting to be loaded as soon as this one returns. Jane Araf, NPR News, Amman. It's NPR News. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Progressive Insurance with Snapshot, a personalized program that bases rates on safe driving habits at Progressive.com. Not available in California or from all agents. This is NPR. Good afternoon. I'm Mary Carol Magazzini with news from Vermont Public. Pediatric obesity medicine specialists in Connecticut are seeing a surge in children and teens using a class of injectable drugs for weight loss. Dr. Jessica Williams at Connecticut Children's says her practice is seeing a 50 percent increase in kids and teens using drugs like Ozempic and Wegovy. The reason that we're seeing that increase is that we understand that obesity is a severe medical condition. There are risks to that patient. And we do now have treatments available that are safe and appropriate that can be a game changer. 
But both drugs have gotten so popular there's now a shortage, and doctors worry that some children and teens are turning to medication too fast without first trying diet and exercise. Wegovy is approved for weight loss in children 12 and up, Ozempic was originally developed to help type 2 diabetes, but has also found recent popularity as an off-label prescription for weight loss. Vermont Edition covered this topic last month. Catch the full episode on how these weight loss drugs work and why people take them at vermontpublic.org. Vermont's Medicaid claims system remains down and could be weeks away from fully coming online. Change Healthcare experienced a cyber attack last month, which has led to a widespread shutdown of software which is relied upon by pharmacies and care providers across the country. That's according to VT Digger. While key parts of Change Healthcare's pharmacy services system have been restored, in Vermont, the Health Access Department has said that the Medicaid claims processing system could be affected for weeks. Vermonters who organize meals programs for rural seniors are calling for more funding and more volunteers. Vermont's population is aging at a rapid clip, and advocates for seniors in the Northeast Kingdom say more and more people are relying on programs like Meals on Wheels and local food shelves. Meg Burmeister is executive director of the Northeast Kingdom Council on Aging. Yesterday on Vermont Edition, she said volunteers provide meals for older Vermonters throughout Essex County, and they need more support. I think we have to realize that nothing in life is free. The funding has not increased to keep up with things like the food costs that have occurred and the challenges that people face in terms of supply and demand. Essex County has the oldest median population of all Vermont's 14 counties. One in 30 Essex County residents are over 60 years old. Today's Eye on the Sky forecast becoming mostly sunny, blustery, and not as cold. Highs 40 to 45 north, some upper 30s northeast and upper 40s to low 50s in the south. For Vermont Public, I'm Mary Carol Maganzini. This is Vermont Edition. I'm Michaela Lefrac. Video games aren't just a fun thing to do at home, by yourself, or with friends. Gaming is a big business that draws big crowds to competitions, showcases, and increasingly movies and TV shows based off of popular games. Today on the show, we're going to be looking at gaming in our region. It's a topic we hit on about a year ago in a show we did on esports, and a lot's happened since then. And we are also trying something new today. We are streaming today's show on Twitch. If you haven't heard of it, it's a live streaming platform that a lot of gamers use to interact with viewers. We'll be taking questions in the regular way, calls and emails, but also from viewers on Twitch. Later in the hour, we're going to be joined by a game production professor at Champlain College in Burlington and an esports training center for kids and teens in Essex Junction. But first, I'm joined in the studio by my colleague, Bryant Denton. By day, he works on our station's digital team. He also reports on video game culture for NPR. Bryant, welcome. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're glad you're here. So how long have you been into video games? How long have you been playing? Uh, I mean, it's hard to answer, you know. Um, I want to say as long as I can remember, you know, Uh but, you know, you, we had a Sega Genesis growing up, then you get a new console, an N64, a PlayStation. It all kind of blends together. You don't you don't know exactly where it starts. Mm. But um, probably one of the games that I remember, have like the most fond memories of starting, is a game called Diablo 2 that came out in 2000. So at least since 2000. <laughs> all right, so that's what really got you hooked. Yeah. And, and today, uh, you're going to be sharing some reporting you did on a specific genre in the world of video games um, around horror. Uh, tell us more. Yeah. Why, why is this of interest? Yeah. Um, well, how, how I began to start covering horror was NPR started doing some reporting around games a couple years ago, and they just said, "Hey, will you play these games?" And they just it just kept it just kept coming to me that they were these horror games. Um, there's a bunch of niche genres in horror, but survival horror is what a lot of it is called. So I was playing these games, and uh, last year was just a big year in horror. A lot of games came out. There were um, some some updates and remakes and 
long long awaited sequels that we saw. So I've just been um I've always been attracted to those games. They're I don't get too scared. It's <laughs> it's fun. Um I like darker themes. I just I can handle it, I suppose. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I've, I've always kind of liked the horror genre. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, braver than me. We did a show about horror movies, uh, last October for Halloween and like just doing a radio show about horror movies made me feel <laughs> scared because I'm such a baby. <laughs> well, right. In a moment, we're going to hear some reporting that you did on this subject, but before we do, could you tell us a little bit about how you reported on this story in this region? Like, is there cool stuff going on in the world of video games and in horror that is right around us yeah well in there's the gaming the gaming scene in vermont is getting bigger every day there's a lot of you know with champlain college the students there um they have their esports program and they have they have teams they have clubs you know students are running these clubs so you can you can find and a lot of people playing different games um there's uh they do game jams where you know people will they're developing games, and you can play games that people are developing. So if you if you find the right people, you get online. A lot of it's online. You got to join a Discord. You got to watch on Twitch. But you can find it. There's a there's a lot going on in Vermont when it comes to games. And you went up to Montreal or talked to somebody in Montreal. I talked to some people who had been going to Montreal. They, you know, people from out of state and Montreal will come to certain events here. So. It's been going on for a while. It's not something new, but you had to be you got to you got to be in the know. All right. Well, let's all get in the know and take a listen to your reporting. Thank you. After a dazzling performance of I'm Just Ken from Ryan Gosling at the Oscars, we say goodbye to the cultural phenomenon that was Barbenheimer. A movie that was left out of the award show was the Super Mario Bros. movie, which deprived us of a dramatic rendition of Jack Black's love ballad Peaches, which we hear now. But without awards, the movie still goes down in history as the highest grossing video game movie of all time at $1.36 billion in ticket sales. But a movie that had quiet success came from another video game, Five Nights at Freddy's. Welcome to Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. The series plays with an unsettling thought. What if the animatronic mascot Chuck E. Cheese wanted to harm your child? Where fantasy and fun come to life. Critics panned the film, but it was the highest-grossing horror film of the year, beating out updates to long-standing franchises like Saw and Scream, and new titles like Megan and Talk to Me. Sometimes a video game will get so popular that the mainstream media has to address it. That was Jenna Stieber, a video game journalist who's also entrenched in the world of horror. A lot of happenings in the industry just go unremarked on unless it is being written about by a video game-specific imprint. 2023 was a standout year for horror in Hollywood. With 55 releases on the big screen and record numbers at the box office, the second highest grossing year the genre's ever seen. And horror took the spotlight on the video game scene as well, with remakes of legendary games like Resident Evil 4 and Dead Space and the long-awaited sequel Alan Wake 2. Stieber says that traditional news outlets like the New York Times or Washington Post don't spend as much time covering video games like they do with other art forms. You can trace that from Pac-Man to Fortnite. Like there, there will always be a game that's so big that it cannot be ignored anymore. But then there's also the chance that it will always be seen as a sort of a second class medium in the same way that horror has, I would say, largely for its whole existence. Every human knows what fear is. Putting it in a safe space like a video game or a movie or a book you're reading is something that every human will be attracted to. That was Dave Richard. He knows a thing or two about how fear can be a way to engage an audience as the senior creative director at Behavior Studios in Montreal, who developed the game Dead by Daylight. The 2016 multiplayer game plays like a giant horror movie mashup, featuring iconic villains you'd expect on the Mount Rushmore of horror and the survivors in those stories as well. In a horror story, there are only victims and monsters. One of the latest characters featured is none other than Alan Wake, the titular character of a game that won Best Narrative, Best Art Direction, and Game Direction at the 2023 Game Awards. Each license we got gave us a little bit more credibility. It's like a snowball effect. 
But like some of the best horror movies out there, Dead by Daylight doesn't take itself too seriously, featuring a fictionalized version of Nicolas Cage as a playable character. I also spoke to Jade Moore from Champlain College. Jade is an undergrad studying creative media. She got hooked on Dead by Daylight after watching streamers play it on the online platform Twitch. I asked Jade that same question. Why torture yourself? Why play a game so scary? It's actually funny. I despise horror. Like, I don't like watching scary movies. I hate playing scary games. Although out of her comfort zone, Jade put her fear to the side. I was like, okay, I'm going to try it out. In a game of Dead by Daylight, one person plays the villain and four people play survivors. Survivors can hear their hearts beating out of their chest as they run away from the villain who (laughs) aims to offer their soul up to a cosmic being known as the Entity. In my conversation with Stieber, the topic of elevated horror or prestige horror came up, a framing of the emerging subgenre of art house films like Get Out, The Witch, or Hereditary that tend to have audiences and critics discussing the social commentary more than your average monster movie or slasher flick. Dave Richard had some thoughts, too. Horror is, is morphing and is trying something new. There's a good balance of the classics that we expect, and also other sources that makes it original instead by its own to renew the experience. And Behavior Interactive is trying something new, too. After developing the DVD universe over seven years, they've announced a single-player game called The Casting of Frank Stone, which will dive deeper into their original lore. At the end of the day, people will seek out the forms of entertainment that speak to them. A biographical film about historic events, social critique on our society, or a twisted tale of fiction full of jump scares. The most memorable titles stand out when they have rich storytelling we can relate to, which comes at no surprise. Help! 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 What I'm left wondering is, did Nick Cage make it out safe? Seriously! Help! Someone should check on him. Okay, I I missed something somewhere along the way. How do I get out of this hell hole? For Vermont Public, I'm Bryant Denton. Well, if you are a video game enthusiast or play some of those games that Bryant, my colleague, was just reporting on, give us a call at 800-639-2211. You can also email us at vermontedition at vermontpublic.org. So, Bryant, please tell, tell me more about what you like about the environment of one of these games, because to me it sounds pretty stressful. Yeah, no, it is. it is stressful, and that... The first time you're playing one of those games, uh, or me, I'm I'm screaming, I'm jumping up out of my chair, I'm like, why am I doing this? But then once you, when you come back to it, because you know, in a video game, you might die, you might have to, <laughs> you might have to come back and try again. It gets easier, and and it's it's more fun once you once you get past that initial hurdle of fear, um, and it and it's funny. Sometimes it, they they're they're funny. It might be. You can, it sounds kind of grim, but you can actually die in a funny way in a game. And um, I don't know. That's always, uh, that's always something I've liked. Yeah. Well, we just heard Nicolas Cage and I know other celebrities like Keanu Reeves have lent his likeness and a voice to a game. Uh, Liam Neeson voiced a character in Fallout 3. It seems like celebrities are, are really starting to recognize the the story and the craft and maybe the, the big... Uh, opportunities for profit uh, that come with video games. Yeah, no, it's really coming together. There's a lot of a lot of voice actors who you you can hear them in many games and you know the show The Last of Us that came out last yeah. year, that was a big crossover where we saw we saw not only voice actors who were in that game on the screen, but it was it was a success in many ways that it just it they're they're translating a little bit better now and Hollywood and the game industry they're working closer they always have been there's always been people who you know voice actors who are doing all these games and then you see them on a television show and you're like wait I recognize their voice somehow mm. that's always been happening but now it's a little more in your face with actors and their likeness being put in games there's a game called Death Stranding that has Norman Reedus and Mads Mikkelsen and a whole bunch of other cast and they've more of those types of games are coming out. It's becoming more 
more normal, I would say. Well, let's go to the phones. We have a call from Brian in Montreal. Brian, you're on the air. Go ahead. Yes, hi. Thanks for taking my call. It's uh, it's great to uh, have this subject uh, covered in the uh, the media. I work for a game company in Montreal here. Uh, I've been developing games for over 30 years, uh, different types of genres on different systems, and uh, just seeing it evolve um, over the past three decades, uh, you know, becoming the, uh, the blockbuster money-making entertainment uh, platform that it is. And, uh, and it's, always, uh, it's always nice to see what new challenges the industry brings. Mm. Brian, can I ask, what, what's the scene like in Montreal? Are there a lot of companies like the one that you work for uh, in this area? Does it feel like a really you know, fruitful ecosystem for game design and production? It does. It does. Actually, that there are a few different um, uh, colleges uh, and universities here that will teach uh, video game production uh, as a way to introduce people that want to get into the industry. Uh, there's a place called uh, Izar. They teach game design. They teach uh, three modeling, uh, different art packages. There's Sin Studio, which te- uh, teaches concept art uh, production for uh, for a game production, that is, uh, and teaches you, you know, what the uh, companies would be looking for in terms of um, how to present your work and what a uh, typical production pipeline would run like. Hmm. Well, Brian, thank you so much for calling in. And in just a couple moments, we'll also hear from a uh, professor at Champlain College here in Burlington that has uh, a also very well-developed program for many of the areas that Brian was just talking about that's going on in Montreal. Um, Brian, uh, to wrap up here, what's something about your reporting that that surprised you something that you learned that you didn't expect, or maybe a path that you want to want to go down in your future reporting on video games and the gaming industry. Yeah. So when I, uh, when I began reporting on this, I did reach out to Champlain college to sort of see if I could work with some students. And I did end up working with who we heard in the, uh, the report I had Jade Moore. And when she told me that she wasn't really a horror fan, but dead by daylight was her favorite game. It was confounding. It was like this is this is the game that is horror, <laughs> encap- <laughs> encapsula- encapsulates the whole genre. Yeah. So I was just like, how do you end up playing this? So it was more it was more thinking about everyone has their own reasons about how they can play a game and why they're playing it and what makes it fun to them. So it's I kind of want to explore that more and find out why people like what they like in uh, this huge genre, this huge mm. industry. Well, so. for me, it's Mario Kart always and forever. <laughs> well, that's a classic. That, that's a classic. That never goes away. <laughs> Vermont Public's Bryant Denton, thank you so much for your reporting and for talking with us about oh, it. thank you. Thank you. And in just a moment, we're going to keep the conversation going. We'll be joined by a video game professor as well as the head of a local esports dojo. Now, if you work in the game industry, tell us how you got into it. Or maybe you have questions about doing just that. You can call us at 800-639-2211, email us at vermontedition at vermontpublic.org, or head over to the streaming platform Twitch to comment there. This is Vermont Edition. Stay with us. Vermont will see a total solar eclipse on April 8th. Here's Fairbanks Museum meteorologist Mark Breen. With the sun temporarily hidden by the moon, temperatures on the ground will fall. Expect a drop in temperature of about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on humidity levels and cloud cover. Experience this once-in-a-lifetime event with Vermont Public. Find resources, learning guides, and more at vermontpublic.org slash eclipse. We have support from our listeners and Northern Stage and White River Junction. With The Play That Goes Wrong, a story of comedy and chaos, March 13th through April 14th, northernstage.org. And Lawson's Finest Liquids in Waitsfield, committed to strengthening communities through social impact programs. Learn more at lawsonsfinest.com. Welcome back to Vermont Edition. I'm Michaela LaFrac. It takes a village to create a video game. 
from narrative designers to programmers to marketers, many, many people have to work together to build a successful game and get it out in the world. For the rest of the hour, we are going to look at the local pipelines into the world of video game production and esports. If you are a gamer and you want to tell us about your favorite game or how you got into this world, maybe you make some money off of it, give us a call. Our number is 800-639-2211. You can also email us at vermontedition at vermontpublic.org. And I also want to remind folks that we are streaming today's show on Twitch, which, if you haven't heard of it, is a popular site for gamers. We're going to be taking questions from our audience there, as well as from our calls and emails. Now, our next guest knows all that it takes to develop a video game. Jesse Gagnon is a producer, narrative designer, and anthropologist who has worked for studios like Riot Games, where she helped grow the wildly popular game League of Legends. She's now the program director of game production management, game business, and publishing at Champlain College in Burlington. Jesse, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. We're so happy to have you. Now, tell us a little bit more first about working on League of Legends. I, I, <laughs> I don't really play a lot of video games, but I know that game. It is huge. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I started at Riot Games in 2012, which, uh, is, you know, hard to think about. I was employee number 220, I think. We were very small back then. Uh, the company rapidly grew into, you know, a couple thousand people uh and it was a challenge working on league of legends the game grew faster than you know we had expected and developing a game that's growing that quickly that is you know 24 7 live has to have a lot of hardware to run it is quite the adventure um but yeah i i'm so glad i went on that adventure i you know i grew up in new hampshire and ended up uh, living in Japan for a couple of years before that teaching English and then Riot hired me and the rest is history. I, I jumped the fence from <laughs> anthropology into game production. Wow. And I know the, the gaming industry, as you've described it, has changed so much over the years. Uh, does it still feel in a way like a boys club or is that changing too? It's changing. Uh, you know, I'm pretty happy to say that when I joined, the often cited statistic was that, you know, women were less than 10% of game developers. And over the years, you know, I've seen reports suggesting that women and non-binary, you know, non, non -cis, uh male game developers has gone up to about 27%, mm -hmm. which is really great and heartening. Obviously, we can get that number much higher. Uh, and, you know, that's actually why I turned to teaching. I really wanted to help increase diversity and opportunity in the industry. Um, but yeah, it, it you know, it's gotten better even just in the past 10 years. I've been so impressed with how much that has changed. Mm. Well, let's add one more voice to the conversation here. Grant Peterson is the owner of the WNFC Esports Dojo in Essex Junction. It's a training center of sorts for kids and teens who play video games competitively. Grant, thanks so much for joining us. Hi there. So tell us a little bit about the history of the dojo. Gosh, I moved to Vermont in December of 2020. And where I come from, it was Daytona Beach, Florida. Uh, you did the opposite move right. that a lot of people Most here people do. Most <laughs> people move south. I did not. Uh, so the fighting game scene is very, very strong down there. In fact, Daytona Beach is home to CEO, which is stands for Community Effort Orlando. It started in Orlando, but had to move to Daytona's Ocean Center because it got so large. Hmm. It is... Effectively, I would say at that point was the second largest fighting game tournament on planet Earth. Um, 6,000 or so people would descend in, 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 during a long weekend. So I come from a strong scene of that. I grew up in the arcades. It was really kind of my thing. Um, when I moved here, we, I noticed we didn't have a fighting game scene. I tried to find one. It was, it was very, very slow going and a lot of digging to find nothing. So I uh, decided to create one, and I got together with a couple of like-minded individuals, and we kind of built this thing out. It started off as just a group of maybe five or six people just coming together every Wednesday. It was called the Wednesday Night Fight Club. And 
Uh, right after that, we got together with Champlain College uh, because we needed a place to grow and kind of thrive. And Christian Conazal, the director of esports there, was really, really kind to us and gave us the place to do that. But the longer I, we were hosting weekly events, the more I started to realize that we weren't getting the kids that were started it at the same time I did. Like the really the best time to start anything, training in anything is when you're a child. Hmm. So it's too late for me. Uh, no, it's not too late. It's never too late ever. <laughs> like I could teach you and I could have you speaking our parlance probably within a week. All right. We'll talk. <laughs> but the, uh, the, I wanted to bring kids into it because when you break down what playing fighting games is all about, it's really to a surface level, you're looking at two people fighting one another, but to a trained eye, you're watching two people fight themselves. It is, you're fighting your biases. You're mm. fighting your patterns of behavior. You're fighting your predispositions. So there's a lot of self-analysis and self-reflection and self-improvement that takes place through the, the process of getting better. Mm. And that's something you can take and apply life wide. Huh. So when I was like, okay, well, what do we do to, to help kids? What do we do to yeah. bring kids into this? My thought was to create an after school program and a summer program. So that way you could bring those kids that were locked to their couch or not really doing, you know, socializing. You know, there's a lot of stuff online where you have the social connection, but it's not the same. It's not the same as trying to learn from someone who is literally next to you. And in the arcade, it was very dog-eat-dog sort of mentality, and I didn't want to replicate that. I wanted to give something with more structure and more positivity and more lessons of saying it's okay to embrace failure as a stepping stone to success. Mm. It's okay to struggle with something if it means you're getting stronger. And there's a very steel sharp and steel mentality, but yet it's very, very kind, and, and I want to put that in a more positive light so that way it's not just pressing buttons like there's something that you can gain from it hmm. yeah i, I want to dive into those those like values that you're describing for just a moment uh, with both uh you and and jesse gagnon mm -hmm. uh, because we you know we started out this conversation talking about this genre of of horror um and also mm -hmm. some of the violence that's inherent to a lot of video games uh, but then you know I, I hear you talking, Jesse, um, and um, you as well, Grant, about how, uh, like, how how um, uh, how powerful these communities of gamers can be. These core values of working together, teamwork, you know, building something together, developing skills um, over a long period of time. Those sound, you know, very wholesome and nurturing. Uh, so, <laughs> first, Jesse, let's start with you. I, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on this kind of like this dichotomy between you know some of like the violence and the horror of the games that might be played but the the like the joy and the camaraderie and the interpersonal skills that can be gained by playing them is yeah absolutely so you know there's a couple different flavors of this right on um, uh, you know league of legends we always compare to any other sports team right you have to train a five person team to be better at League of Legends, you work really hard together, you spend time practicing, you know, like you would on any other sports team. And, you know, you develop this really close sense of camaraderie and trust in one another and, you know, communicate about, hey, what could we have done better in that last match, right? Um, and then in the community itself, you know, we had so many passionate fans who, even if they didn't play the game, maybe they watched Arcane, right? Or maybe they were huge into cosplay. We had this absolutely massive, you know, just absolutely wonderful community of cosplayers who continue to impress me with making costumes and they would get together and have sewing sessions at PAX, which was just, as you said, it's really wholesome and wonderful. Uh, and some of the other flavors of this, you know, in the horror game community in particular is you have these massive uh, games like Dead by Daylight or some of the more uh, viral streamed games right now, you know, that are coming out, uh, such as Lethal Company, those players are coming together over a shared interest and, you know, positive reinforcement in the community itself 
often creates such positive outcomes among those people. So I, I And I actually know a few people who met, God, years and years ago now on World of Warcraft who, you know, are married, for example. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think this phenomenon has been growing for quite some time. And it, it's very interesting to see how folks have made communities and friendships and these other, you know, really positive spaces thanks to video games, despite, you know, whether or not they have violence in the content, right? <laughs> mm. Well, listeners, if you have thoughts on this conversation, we would love to include you as well. 800-639-2211 is our number. Um, Grant, I'm curious if you have to have uh, conversations any times with parents of kids about the types of games you're playing or, or kind of talking through those those values that that you you know are kind of imbuing in your work at the dojo do you ever get some like uh some parents coming to you being like i don't you know i didn't grow up doing these i don't i don't know what's what the scene is like all the time yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah all the time. what are those conversations like uh productive yeah very productive i think once most parents i mean as a, a father of two myself it's really important to have your children engaged in something that means something. It's got to be meaningful. It, you don't you don't just play something to play something. You're there to get something from it. You're there to learn something and grow a skill set. Uh, that's why the dojo actually has tech skills. We actually teach other stuff as well to try to touch off on on things that are. Pardon me one second. Sure. Water is essential. Uh, <laughs> We try to teach things that are connected to gaming. So things like webcasting, uh, video game design, uh, media design, things like video editing, things like that. Stuff that kids get into, they see like, oh, I, I love my YouTubers, but okay, well, how do they do that? Yeah. I want to teach you how to do that because there's a lot of things that you learn that, that can cross over. But then whenever we look at fighting games themselves, what I teach – it's more like a martial art than anything else. Hmm. It's more, there's a discipline, there's a focus, there's a dedication to the betterment of self. And and that is a, such a, a, a valuable trait to have because it can really set, you up, uh, set yourself up for success in profound ways. Um, the one thing I, I tell parents all the time, and this is much to the chagrin of children, is that we don't play shooters. And as much as I appreciate team games like MOBAs, things like League of Legends, um, I don't, I don't teach uh, anything that involves a team because I want this to be more self-focused and more self-driven. I want them to come together as a community in our dojo, but it's a individualized practice. Mm. And I don't ever want to play shooters because I never want to answer the question, why have you taught my child to shoot another child? Hmm. That's not it, just the optics of that alone is not something I want to face. Hmm. So I keep things kind of limited. We do branch out into things like we'll play Mario Maker and we'll look at how levels are designed and we'll try to say, okay, what makes things fun? What makes things challenging? Can you understand the nature of challenge? And, and kids really respond to that. Yeah. I love watching them create things, build things. And then I love taking them back to fighting games and saying, okay, can you be creative in a limited box? Because yeah. most creatives really only thrive when they have to break out of constraints. Mm. So show me how your approach is creative. Show me how you can use the tools, a limited set of tools, to both simultaneously present and solve problems. Mm. And and how do you master your own anxieties in the moment. Mm. Well, Jesse, I'm curious for your thoughts here on on something that Grant just said about um, about not playing shooters, about playing lots of different kinds of games um, with mm -hmm. the kids that he works with. Are, are there certain types of games that folks are, you know, coming to your program, you particularly interested in um, any any trends towards or away um, certain types of games, including like the the games that involve shooting or, or, you know, types of violence that parents might not want their kids to be playing? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, there's a, there's a couple different things I'd say going on that often match 
uh, some of our more industry-based trends. Mm -hmm. So for example, we know Fortnite is extremely popular. Uh, we see an increase in teams wanting to make more fantasy, fa you know, fantasy-based or science fiction-based shooters. Uh, so I have a senior team right now making a game called Sync, uh, but you're playing as robots and you're shooting other robots, right? So, you know, it's, it's not based in realism. Uh, I haven't seen sort of a more realism grounded shooter in my time working here and i think that matches a lot of what's you know more popular in the industry right now uh so you know that's what we would call our our t for teen <laughs> rated <laughs> range uh in terms of its fantasy violence right it's not you know based in the more realistic look of uh cod uh, call of duty for example mm -hmm. so we see that uh, last year I had actually a horror game, which was great. Uh, I was super excited to see one. So that was Kessler Syndrome, which was atmospheric space horror. Mm -hmm. uh, you played an astronaut stranded on a space station. You had to figure out, you know, how to survive, how to oh, get through I feel through like I've had that very... actual nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it was... It was pretty scary. I kept telling them uh, if I loaded it up on my, uh, you know, VR headset, it would have been absolutely claustrophobic <laughs> inducing. <laughs> but oh. yeah, you know, I think we also get a lot of interest in roguelikes and roguelites right now. Those are very popular in the industry as well, mm. right? Uh, but, you know, it's tough because we also have to teach students to balance what they're capable of making uh, in a, you know, a team of 16 people over the course of a year, right? Mm -hmm. There's only so much you can make in that amount of time. And making a game is very challenging. Uh, it's part of why we have them make games three years in a row in this interdisciplinary, uh, you know, studio format, because we know if they don't practice that loop over and over uh you know they won't get that better understanding of how difficult it actually is to make a game in a team mm. and come together you know like a real game studio um and it's why we mirror studio practices because we want them to basically show up day one on whatever job they get to and say oh yeah okay you do this the same way we did at college uh, I'm ready to, you know, be an associate level employee here and make games. Mm -hmm. So, well, you brought up some popular games, and uh, we just got a couple of emails in from listeners telling us about the games that they like to play. Uh, Brett in Brookline, Vermont, writes, I was a huge fan of older horror games, and one of my favorites was a game called Doom. Years oh, later, yeah. I replaced that with the Resident Evil series. Jason from Montreal writes, I've been a fan uh, of since I was 15, and now I am 46, and I played i used to play sonic they're right i cherish the games but i don't play sonic games anymore the plush toys though are incredible about 10 or 15 years ago i was on a car ride with my dad and we ended up in san francisco i knew there was a sega building there uh but it was closed i was deeply disappointed thanks jason for writing in um we're gonna keep this conversation going but we do have to take one more quick break this is vermont edition stay with us Vermont Edition is brought to you in part by the Lintelac Foundation, supporting hunger-free Vermont and NOFA Vermont to help ensure Vermonters have access to healthy and nourishing food. Coming up today during the 1 o'clock hour, Nicholas Winton helped rescue hundreds of children from the Nazis. Sir Anthony Hopkins says portraying the hero in a new film was personal for him. He joins Here and Now to talk about it. That's coming up today during the 1 o'clock hour. Support for programming comes from our listeners and Fidium Fiber Internet, offering multi-gig fiber to over 108,000 Vermonters. Designed to improve economic, educational, and employment opportunities, FidiumFiber.com. And Bromley Manor, Manchester, offering assisted living, memory care, and a new wing of independent apartments with dens and private patios, BromleyManor.org. 
Welcome back to Vermont Edition. I'm Michaela Lefrac. Uh, before we get back to today's conversation on video games, I do want to let you know what we're talking about tomorrow. We have a pretty exciting guest, Burlington's mayor-elect Emma mulvaney Stanick. She's the first woman and openly LGBTQ plus person to be elected mayor of the Queen City. We'll hear from her about her priorities for her early days in office. And you can send us your questions for Emma mulvaney Stanick to Vermont Edition at vermontpublic.org. We'll also get an update on this year's sugaring season from the folks at UVM Extension and hear about a Brattleboro organization working to get more women and non-binary people into the music industry. Lots to talk about, so be sure to join us tomorrow, Wednesday at noon. All right, let's get back to today's conversation on video games. Our guests are Jesse Gagnon, the pro- Program Director of Game Production Management, Game Business, and Publishing at Champlain College in Burlington. We're also joined by Grant Peterson, the owner of WNFC Esports Dojo in Essex Junction. Grant, there was a big local tournament here this past weekend, right? Sure Can you tell was. us about it? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I... Uh... Well, uh, we've been putting together tournaments for a number of months. Uh, we usually do our our schedule runs that we do weekly because, again, Wednesday Night Fight Club, we always run weekly Wednesdays. And then we have Saturdays at Champlain as well. And normally twice a month at Champlain we do tournaments. It's smaller, more locally focused, but it's always kind of a nice way to see who stacks up on top of the pile in particular games. We decided... Uh, to make something a bit larger. Burlington Beer Company actually reached out to us and asked us to host an event. And I said, uh, sure. So (laughs) we decided to host a Tekken 8 tournament there and marketed it and and set everything up. Uh, Luckily, we we had a couple of people in the community to help help furnish and bolster the prize package for uh, the top finishers. And we were able to get... A lot of people to come out and play. My my target, the, the baseline for, for things to have been, you know, to justify its own existence was 20 competitors. And my ambitious goal was 40. I'm like, All right, we can double that. That's rookie numbers. We can get that up. And we ended up getting 47 with seven disqualified uh, from either not showing up or not being able to make it. Um, and that included players from New York, Boston and Montreal. Nice. And, and not only that, but we also have all of our Vermont FGC fighting game community. Uh, but we also had our dojo students, and our dojo students are sponsored. So it's part of their curriculum to step in and challenge themselves and to learn and to kind of face down the the pressure of that moment and to, to kind of learn more about yourself and how mm-hmm. you react to things when things seem, you know, wow, there's people cheering behind me. I'm on stage. Like, how do I feel? And and between that and about, you know, 100 plus spectators, uh, people have been uh, making claims that it's been the largest esports event that Vermont's ever seen. And my only answer to that is yet. <laughs> so stay tuned on that front. But Very it was exciting. a it was a really fantastic event. And I can't I have so much undying gratitude for the guys at BB Co and Champlain Esports, all of the people that worked with us, all of our volunteer staff, uh, people in our community are just absolute diamonds, and I would not be able to get this done without them. Yeah. Well, a reminder, listeners, that we are streaming this show today on Twitch. We have some folks following along there. Um, we got a comment from a Twitch user called Banana Fangs, who writes, Voices of the Void is a great game. I've been all about co-op games since the pandemic, and it's a great way to connect with friends that live out of state. Well, thanks for following us along on Twitch. And uh, Jesse, um you know, we just heard from Grant about some big ambitions for bringing more gamers together in the state of Vermont. What are you seeing um, uh, growing about the local or regional scene? Yeah, so, gosh, I've been here two years now. It was great to move back to New England. And I, you know, I really love being in Burlington. You know, the the thing that i think really blew me away when i got here is we have 623 students enrolled 
in our game programs here at Champlain College. And that's a tremendous amount of development and technical resource for the state of Vermont on graduation. Uh, and so I've been encouraging more of them to get involved in indie game development. We do already have a couple game studios uh, founded here in Burlington by alumni, such as Weathered Sweater. And, you know, the grants that have been coming through for technology in Vermont also make it a really good opportunity space to continue game development in Vermont. Uh, particularly post-graduation. So uh, I've also been talking to uh, some other studios and trying to convince them to start up some development here in Vermont because it's much cheaper uh, than California, for example, to make a game here. Uh, but nothing too concrete on that yet. I'll let you know if I ever uh, get one of them to sign up for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like there's a lot of exciting stuff going on right now. And uh, thanks as well to everybody who's following on Twitch. Catfish, Catfish Blues writes, I love playing Harvest Moon, Fishing Resort, and a small hike. Scenic games with fishing that help cure my fix when it's too cold to go fishing. Well, it's never too cold to go fishing in Vermont, <laughs> according to lots of folks here. So if you're not here now, you should come on up and visit and maybe visit the dojo or Champlain College while you're at it. Now, there are lots of auxiliary ways to be involved uh, in esports from handling cameras to facilitating live production of these competitions like Grant, I know mm -hmm. you've been doing. Uh, first, Jesse, could you talk about some of the ways in which students can get involved uh, outside of actually you know, sitting down and competing? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for esports in particular, you know, we provide them with all the skills to run a stream, do shout casting, which is uh, when you host a live match, right? And you actually call the play-by-plays that are being made. Uh, much of that actually came from learnings from ESPN that were incorporated into studios like Riot Games uh, for League of Legends. So they can learn all those best practices. We also make sure our students get a really firm grounding in understanding what content creation needs in terms of how do you create a cohesive brand, right? How do you talk about yourself as a developer and how do you talk about, you know, yourself on a team, right? Uh, all the best practices that sort of go into feed into that. And then also how do you interface with social media? How do you host positive conversations? How do you moderate those conversations so that they don't trend into, you know, toxic places. Uh, and as a former player behavior producer in particular on League of Legends, I have a lot, a lot of experience in that regard. So we make sure that they're getting a really well-rounded education so that, you know, even if they decide not to go into games or esports, for example, they can still go into nearly any tech company, social media, they can go into software, pretty much anywhere here in Vermont or beyond. And they, they're they fully equipped to hit the ground running on day one. And are these some of the skills that you're also uh, teaching or talking about with the kids that come to the dojo? The right? idea that what what we work with is to give them the rudimentary version of that, to give them sort of hmm. the basics and allow them to kind of explore and grow. Um, <clears throat> I uh, the the idea is that we prepare them with enough exposure and experience with those tools so that way when they decide to move into a collegiate aspiration they can get things like scholarships so at that point you know all we've got rather than introducing them to say webcasting or video production or things of that nature when they're 15 16 years old get them go ahead and expose to it at 9 10 so that way, by the time they're 15, 16, they're already thinking about building portfolio work. That'll start to get them higher education aspirations or even something that can get them a job. So what we do when we're talking about our partnership with Champlain, and I happen to know Jesse somewhat well. Uh, she was one of our most instrumental pieces of last year's summer program. Uh, 
And I still can't thank you enough for that, Jesse. <laughs> I just can't. Um, oh, you're so welcome. It was great. <laughs> uh, the The idea is that to build sort of an on ramp into those programs, so that way it it kind of galvanizes a symbiosis between the two. So mm. it, the I personally believe in the power of education. I think smarter people are always better people. So the more you know, the more you're able to do. The the kids that learn what they learn at the dojo, they kind of choose a track and they're able to explore those technologies and those tools. And it's really less of a deliverables mandated method. Hmm. Normally you get into college, it's you know, how you have deliverables, you have semesters, there are certain yeah. things you need to get done because that's preparing you for the professional environment. Whereas when I'm starting to teach kids this stuff here, there are milestones that we want to hit. There's things that we kind of want to, I want them to feel like they're, they have progress and that they're making progress towards a goal, but I want to let them be more exploratory because I think play is so important, especially at that age. There's, I think the one thing I could probably do to shoot myself in the foot would be to bring them out of school and say, okay, cool. Welcome to another school. You know, <laughs> like there's, there's nothing that's going to kill your interest in your dreams quicker than that. So uh, if I allow you to kind of explore this cool stuff and you're like, okay, cool, but I want to learn how to do this and I want to see if I want to try this. All right. This is a great place for you to build really janky things and have just try and fail and just have fun with it. Like just treat it like Play-Doh. You make a mess and that's fine. You can make a mess. Um, because that's what you're here to do. But every single time you clean up that mess and do it again, the iterative process of what you're doing, you become more and more uh, capable and you build better and better things. And learning fighting games is the same way. You, you strengthen yourself in a practice. And, and if I can help build a track towards them achieving their future dreams, then I've done my job. Mm. Well, it sounds like such a, a close-knit community in a very close-knit state. It's great to hear that you and Jesse are working together on so many of these projects. Um, and thank you to everybody who's been following along on Twitch. This has been a bit of an experiment for us. Um, and, and please continue to comment if you'd like. We've gotten a couple more comments uh, as you were talking, Grant, uh, about favorite games. Um, Selly Petra writes, Anatomy. Oh, Selly. You know Selly? Oh, I know Petra too well. <laughs> Anatomy is a scare, <laughs> is a scary and unsettling look into how we as people treat houses and what happens when you leave them alone. Very spooky. Uh, another user with a username I, I don't think I can pronounce writes, Champlain College Game Design Class of 2009 here. Need to see this featured on Vermont Edition. Still looking for an industry job too. Happy to hear there are indie studios in Vermont. Um, very cool. This has been a really interesting conversation. I have learned a ton Grant Patterson, I apologize. I, I, oh, I've okay. been messing up your name this it's whole okay. show. Grant Patterson, <laughs> uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Um, you run the WNFC Esports Dojo in Essex Junction. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. We've also been joined at this hour by Jesse Gagnon, a producer, narrative designer, and anthropologist, as well as a program director at Champlain College in Burlington. Jesse, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I just want to say if anyone wants to check out Champlain's Twitch show uh, May 3rd, we're going to be streaming our senior show with all our senior games. So stay tuned for that. Nice. Very cool. Thanks for the shout out to that. All right. That is it for today's show. As always, you can weigh in on our show or pitch us ideas like this one to Vermont Edition at vermontpublic.org. Today's show is directed by James Stewart and produced by Tedra Meyer, Andrea Lorian, and Daniela Fierro. Our call screener today was Andrea Lorian, and our theme music was composed by Myra Flynn. I'm Michaela Lafrac. Thank you so much for listening. We'll catch up again soon.
Stay with us for Here and Now. That's coming up next. Thank you for listening. This is Vermont Public. And we have support today from our listeners who donate. And Fairbanks Museum, whose Autosaver Group Build It Lab offers unstructured creative play for kids of all ages. Open now. Fairbanksmuseum.org. And LMMC Concerts, presenting the Aris Quartet at Montreal's Pollock Hall, March 17th. Tickets at lmmc.ca. This is Vermont Public, 88.7 WRVT Rutland, 94.3 WBTN-FM Bennington, 88.5 WVPA St. Johnsbury, 89.5 WVPR Windsor, 88.9 WVBA Brattleboro, 107.9 WVPS Burlington, and on your smart speaker. It's one o'clock. It went well. I think I funding for here and now comes from. I put our stream live so we can hear from my mic right now. Uh, we have uh, 15 viewers and we hit our follower goal of 10 followers. So I think think it was a success. I don't know. We might be. We might be back. We might be back. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, we got it. We got some people tuning in. So, yeah. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, this is working. Um, yeah. Come say hi, Grant. Thank you for everything. Come say hi. Hi. <laughs> what to <what> do? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everyone. I think I'm going to be ending the stream now. Uh, yeah, write us, uh, write us an email, or you know, re- just reach out to the Vermont Edition team on Instagram. We'll uh, we'll see what feedback we've got, and maybe we'll do this again. Yeah, uh, but thanks for tuning in. Thanks.